Oh, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Right, it's lovely to be here. Um, as he said, we were meant to be in a small auditorium, so a little bit terrified to be talking to quite so many of you, but uh, I'm sure we'll be okay. So the title of our talk is Building on a Legacy and uh, Driving Innovation Through Technology. So as you may be able to tell from that, I'm Dave, by the way, the, the large guy's Alex. I'll be handing over to him to talk about some more of the techie stuff. I'm going to talk more about the problem space and a bit of maths. Anyway, we've been working with a, a legacy system, working to uh, replace it and improve on it and all, all those kinds of good things. So I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about what a legacy is. Now, I'm sure there are lots of us here who've worked on legacy systems. I've worked on quite a few now, been around a few years. And uh, there are lots of common perceptions. So the 2CV represents something that's old. The champagne on the right, that isn't celebration champagne. That's not um, what you're drinking to. That represents fragility. One of those glasses at the bottom goes, you've got a lot of spilled champagne and a lot of broken glass. So if you've got something that's old and fragile, you've got something that you feel like shackles you. You're afraid to break it. Developers are afraid to go anywhere near it. And that's true. That is true of quite a few legacy systems. And it's definitely a problem that we deal with in our industry. But I'd like to first offer a warning. Firstly, if you're lucky, you might be building the next legacy system. So remember that what you're writing now, in two years' time or 10 years' time, someone might be looking at it and going, what the hell was this guy thinking? And I like to remind myself, because I've been asked this, uh, this, is some, this isn't the exact code. This doesn't quite work. Um, and it's not immediately apparent what it does. Maybe it is to you, but uh, to a lot of people it isn't. I've got a friend who still works at the company where I wrote something a little bit like this about 10 years ago. And we were out for a drink, and he said, Dave, some of the developers look at your code and all the bitwise operations and the recursion, and they say it works. They know it works. They haven't got a clue how it works. So just remember that you, if you're lucky, because not all systems become legacy systems, because a lot die before they get there, uh, then you might be working on the next legacy system. The other thing is I really like my job, but I'm not sure I'd do it for free. Um, and I get paid to do it. And one of the reasons I get paid is because Betfair is a very successful company, and they can afford to pay me to write the next generation of the Betfair exchange. And the reason they can afford that is because of the legacy system I'm replacing. So I'd like to take a brief aside and talk a little bit about why I like my job so much. And this is an aside, so it won't take very long. Does anyone know who that is? Anyone? Show of hands if you think you might have a clue. No, I didn't think so. Lovely guy. That's a guy called Fred Brooks. Who's heard of him now? Still no one. All right, Frederick P. Brooks is famous for writing a book, well, most famous for writing a book in 1975 called The Mythical Man Month. Brilliant read, dated, different technologies. It was a long time ago. It was at the kind of birth of our industry. But it's worth a read still. You have to translate some of the uh, technologies, etc. And in that, he, uh, and this really is an aside, he produced something that's now known as Brooks's Law, which is if you add uh, more developers to a software project that is late, you will only make it later. And I'm sure that a lot of you can relate to that. I'd like to talk about a paper he wrote in 1986, which is called the No Silver Bullet. Again, it shows its age. He's talking about ADA and small talk and lots of things. I mean, this is way before Java came along or C Sharp, any of those things. Um, no Silver Bullet, essentially, the principle of it and why it still hangs true is he talks about the difference between the essential problems of anything you're doing and the accidental problems. The essential problems are the ones because what you're doing is hard. The accidental ones are 
what tools you're using, what team sizes you are, the fact that you hate your boss, the fact that the office is noisy, etc., etc. I hope you don't hate your boss. I don't, but I think that some people do. Um, now, happen to, oh, and a, a brief aside in case these slides get distributed. If you want to read any of his work, the 20th anniversary edition of the uh, Mythical Man Month contains no silver bullet, lots of responses to both, and lots of updated things. It's still 20 years old, so it's still a little bit out of date. The principles hold true. But happiness to me, and why I like my job, is there's a higher proportion of essential difficulty. There's less of the, the rubbish that gets in the way and how we do it, and more of what we're doing. So why is working on the Betfair exchange hard? Why is there that essential difficulty? Firstly, we're dealing with money, and people um, are a little bit careful with their money. They don't like you losing it. Secondly, and I apologize for the age of some of the numbers on this slide, and I know there are guys from some of the companies, but this uh, slide was put together by the product owner on our API team a while ago. It's old. But the scales are, I mean, some of those numbers have probably grown. Some people will have come in and out. But you get the idea. Where on that do you think Betfair sits? It's a gambling company. I mean, come on. How many bets can people place? The answer is somewhere between Facebook and Netflix. Our public-facing API gets about 2.5 billion hits a day. Most of those are reads. but. A lot of them are bet placements and cancellations as well. And those actual things that change things, uh, I mean, we get thousands of them a second, certainly, on average. So how do we handle that kind of scale? Well, a very long time ago, and this is seriously legacy. I mean, we're talking many years ago now. We had a website and an API that talked to this uh, system that's called the monolith. Uh, and there are a few other things that are to the side that are of no interest, so those have been removed. This is the, the real legacy, going back a long way. There's a reason, or there's a good reason, why that symbol is the same as uh, the commonly used symbol for a database on flowcharts. And that's because a lot of it was in the database. A lot of it was written in PLSQL, in Oracle, um, which obviously doesn't scale particularly well. Nowadays, we have a little bit more of a, uh, well, a better technology stack, should we say. So you've still got the user and then the, the API and the website at the top. But the first talk yesterday um, spoke about microservices. And we have a lot of microservices. And that's what uh, the, this blue layer is, effectively. And particularly to do with bets, we have the ability to read prices uh, and the ability to look at your bets, those that you've placed, and the status of them, and the ability to place bets. However, a lot of it's still in the database. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this bit, thing right at the bottom called the bet matcher. Um, the reason I'm going to talk about that is because Alex is going to go on to some of the streaming technology choices and how we're replacing everything below that blue line. But the bet matcher is at the heart of everything. Uh, it Basically, nothing on the exchange works without it. And it's where all the bets are struck and where people's money is spent, effectively, which is why people care about it. That was in the database. And some of it, some things still run on it in the database in PLSQL. We couldn't do any of the other things that we want to do if that remained the case. And so we've been rewriting it. Now, BBM, bulk bet matcher, written in PLSQL. It's been around for years. The fact that it's been around for years means we have a high level of confidence that it works and it does what it's meant to. Because if it didn't, we'd be getting a lot of complaints. That gives us a challenge when we're rewriting it. Because before you start putting many millions of pounds through it, and we're talking about a lot of money, how do you have the confidence that what you're doing is a correct replacement for it? If, and as I say, if it's one penny out, seriously, one penny, people will notice 
They will go on the, on the phone. It will cost us money. And this, these are all bad things. So one of the ways we do that is to test. We've probably spent quite a lot more time writing tests than we have the system itself. And the particular nature of having this old system that we're confident works means we can do some nifty things with our testing. So some of the time we spent writing a test framework that can run against both the old and the new. So whenever our tester, or actually we all write tests, but we have one guy who's kind of lead QA. Um, whenever we write tests, but well, this certainly is true, it was true up to a few months ago, and this represents a test case. When we check that in, when we commit it, it runs against the old system. And if it passes, then we're confident that that test represents something that uh, actually is meant to happen. Then, of course, when we commit code to the new system, it runs against the tests, and we know that that's all good. This gives us a nice thing, because we can write targeted test cases for edge cases and, and things like that. We can also just fire random stuff at it. And because we've got a known good system, the output from the new system should be the same. The other thing we did was we didn't start. There was no big red button. We didn't say, one day we're running on the old system, and the next we're running on the new. We run them in parallel, and we ramp up. And on day one, we probably had one market on it, which would have been something like crown green bowls. Um, not a great deal of interest in crown green bowls. Uh, we certainly wouldn't have started with the UEFA Champions League final, for example. The, and then we ramp up, and that allows us to grow confidence. OK. So I heard you, sorry, you heard me say that this was building on a legacy, but it was also driving innovation through technology. What about innovation? I'm going to show you that timeline again, but actually, it didn't take us long after turn on of XBM at all before we added a major new feature that wouldn't have been possible in PL SQL. Well, it might have been possible in PL SQL, but it would have been even harder. And last November, uh, it was a Wednesday afternoon, a developer on my team was on the production matcher box. He typed in a curl command. And his nervously, his finger hovered over the enter key. And Alex was sat next to him. And he is a bit of an imposing fella. And he was sat there going, go on, go on, do it. And eventually, he hit enter. And everyone within, well, certainly 20 yards of us, they'd all been hitting F5 on their browsers on the market that would be affected. Command R if you're a, an Apple person. And everyone, in an instant, went, whoa. And the reason is because a market view that looked like that, that had no liquidity in it, no prices available, very little interest, that's of no interest to anyone who wants to bet on a, a, this particular match, suddenly looked like that. Forget the CSS differences. It's the presence of those very different numbers. And that was all possible because of what we'd uh, been doing with that new feature. And that was all possible because of the work we'd done on replacing the matcher and the care we'd taken with it. So what was that? Well, this is today's FA Cup final, a little introduction to Betfair if anyone's not seen it before. Uh, I hope that Aston Villa gets stuffed, not because I'm an Arsenal fan, but because I, I support the mighty West Bromwich Albion. And so I was brought up to hate Villa. And uh, if Villa win, I'm going to be very glad that I'm not in the country tonight. <laughs> what this says is that a whole bunch of people, or possibly one very rich person, uh, if someone wanted to bet on Villa, has said, I will offer you a price of seven. And what that means is, for every pound you place as a bet, if Villa win, I will give you six pounds. And that's how unlikely they think it is that Villa will win. I'm not so sure. I'm worried. But that is classic back versus lay matching. And that's what the matcher does at a very simple level. But let's say someone wanted to uh, back the draw or bet on the draw 
and none of those numbers in the bottom row were there. No one had offered prices on the draw. Well, we can calculate them. Let's say, comparing it to the roll of a die, just so that you get an idea of the kind of odds we're talking about. This is easy. You know that the, if it's a fair die, then the chances of it landing on one of the sides, one of the faces, face up, is one in six. What about in a football match? Well, we can, the inverse of the odds on the exchange is the implied probability of that happening. And, oh, the equation hasn't come out very well, unfortunately, um, but never mind. What you can do is that these should sum to 100%. Now, if you're eagle-eyed and quick at the maths, then you might notice that sums to 102%, and that's the margin, so it, that will be above 100%. If it was less than 100%, you could place bets in the right proportions and be guaranteed to make money. And to compare us with bookies, traditional bookies, the margin that a bookie would offer would give a percentage way over 100%. I mean, it'd be about 120%. That's how they make their money. That's why Betfair is so successful. So the old matcher could do this. It could look at the, the possibilities uh, in a market and calculate how you could cross-match the bets against each other. What we did and why those prices suddenly filled up Ah, phew. <laughs> is we allowed different markets, we, there are many different ways of betting on a football match, we allowed them to match against each other. That's the incoming bet at the top, and this is a, a couple of weeks ago, Chelsea versus Liverpool. We placed bets in those proportions at the bottom four in order to provide the top bet. And what we do is Actually, this, I know this particular example, there were 45 price points available across all the different outcomes on all the markets on that football match. And we effectively, we've got an algorithm, which is kind of guarded knowledge about exactly how that works. But that searches for the best price, and it produced a, a price of 7.2. Um, and that is effectively what went, uh, produced that market to change from having no liquidity on it to having a lot of prices available, and that gives us a world-beating product, and we couldn't have done that without um, rewriting it. Now, at this point, I'm going to hand over to Alex, who's going to talk a little bit more about the techie side of things. Thanks, Dave. So I hope you can hear me as well. So the problem space for us as Dave said, we've got very, very high throughput. Um, and basically, um, many requests per day. And obviously, that's a lot of load on the networking stack. Um, and we haven't got any time for patching. Um, there's always a sporting event around the world somewhere. And we offer pretty much every sporting event you can bet on. So I think we usually do a release at 6 in the morning, just because that's the quietest time and the least impact. Some people still suffer. but. It's the fewest number possible. Um, and the fact that we make more work for ourselves internally. Um, when we say the Grand National is the biggest horse race in the world, um, so when we say it's time to settle that market, we know who's won, that internally causes us, from one internal message, another 7 million, purely in getting customers' accounts, commission, um, balances, and exposure all correct let alone updating the market positions and the prices. And of course, we are bet fair. Uh, bets must be processed in order. Um, if I place a bet before you and my bet is matchable, it must be matched first. And like any financial system, we just can't accept any data loss at all. Um, we must be able to account for everything. Um, we operate in regulated markets. Um, but there are various complexities with various jurisdictions. I won't go into the detail here, but I'm sure the Blip guys can give you some information on how it, what it's like to operate in Italy. <laughs> so, our current state. Well, as Dave said, we used to have an enormous database. 
Um, it's still pretty big, but um, there is obviously an upper limit on what you can do on a single box. Um, so we're moving from the monolith to microservices, and the beauty is each is then horizontally scalable in its own capacity. So as Dave said, we have more reads than we do writes. So we have more instances of the reading service at any time than the writing service. We have a large number of both, but just more reads. It's also, as a developer, very easy to create your own service. Simply write a small document in a language called Rescript, which is sort of REST-like, define your operations, and then we can auto-generate client and server in Java, um, and you can use any HTTP client to invoke the methods, um, which basically means the services can talk to each other very, very easily. Now then, so it's probably best that we do a little bit of distributed theory, uh, just because it's kind of key to our estate. So, have you all heard of the CAP theorem? Good. Um, so, it's worth highlighting the fact that networks will fail. Um, you'll lose packets, um, they'll be slow to arrive, even within your own data center. Um, even last week, we had a switch fail in our production network. Um, some nodes couldn't see the database, some nodes couldn't see Zookeeper, they couldn't perform any leader election, they couldn't persist any data, they couldn't read anything. Not a good place to be. And then, of course, the problem for that, so you can choose, you can be consistent, um, and you just do nothing when your network partition happens, but you know that your state is correct. Or you can be available, and you offer data that may or may not be correct, but at least it's available. Um, now, obviously, lots of bright people have written some very clever mechanisms um, to ensure the reliability works. And there's many algorithms out there. So um, hopefully you've all heard of things like Paxos and Zab, and Raft is a newer one. And those algorithms will look after leader election and data persistence and guaranteeing state. Um, so Zab underlies Zookeeper, um, and Raft is uh, relatively new algorithm, but is used by ETCD and Console and I believe Hydrabase, um, which is coming out shortly, which is exciting. But anyway, it's worth noting, of course, that writing to disk, um, or even disk buffers, if you've got decent kit and you can just write to a buffer and the OS will believe it's written to disk and the disk itself will flush at a later time, um, that still takes time. Um, so you basically you have to choose between reliability and speed. But obviously, we can't choose. I mean, customers can't be waiting for their bets to match. They can't be waiting for price updates. But we can't give them stale prices. If your strategy relies on having an up-to-date price, then surely you want to trust that the price Betfair is giving you is the real one that currently is out there, not something that we knew about half a second earlier. That's just too far behind. So it is a millisecond-based industry. Um, watch any Greyhound market coming up to the point when the trap's open, and you'll see an enormous number of bets coming in, um, bots jostling for position, trying to take any money that looks like it's free money. Um, yes, put it this way. If it was up to you, how would you write a Twitter firehose? So Twitter have more messages than us per, per day, but I don't think they have to be ordered. I don't think every tweet has to be ordered, and I don't think they have to guarantee reliability of every message. They can probably allow people to resubmit. So how would you implement the Twitter firehose in an ordered, reliable way? Have a think about it on the way home, see what you come up with. So we've talked about Kafka, mentioned earlier that it was in the middle, well, is in the picture earlier. It's um, a brilliant tool, um, very easy to set up, um, provides a distributed commit log that can handle enormous throughput. Uh, it can handle small and large messages. Um, it's massively configurable. Um, why wouldn't you use it for everything? Uh, well, it, the only downside, it sits on the availability side of CAP. So it prefers availability to reliability. Uh, so therefore, we can't guarantee that the state that we're getting from a Kafka broker is the real state of the world if that Kafka broker has been partitioned. 
and downside for its safest write mode, which will allow us to apparently have CAP, unfortunately, add so much latency between each message that, unfortunately, um, it just isn't feasible. Uh, the time it taken for the message to be available to a consumer, having been processed and produced, is just too long. Oh, that's not what I wanted. That's better. So, what else can we use then? Well, there aren't really any off-the-shelf tools that do what we want, it appears. I've had a good look for them. Um, the ones I mentioned, Zookeeper, ETDD, console, they all provide the reliability guarantees, but unfortunately wouldn't handle the scale. They're not designed for the sheer number of messages that we want to use. Uh, Datomic, which is quite an elegant tool, um, treats everything as a fact, so every piece of data is immutable, and you build up the state as you go. Um, that would take too long for a failover and too long to catch up. Um, unfortunately, it looks like it would have too many bottlenecks. Um, I'm a big fan of Redis, Mongo, and Elastic, um, but they've all been proven to lose data under a partition, um, even with their safest write modes. Uh, I don't know if any of you have played with the Jepson framework. Have a look at it. It's, um, it's a very good framework for testing distributed systems, and he is quite easily broken quite widely used tools. So, what are we doing about it? Well, we're customizing our own journaling approach. So, we're writing a framework that will always be on the persistent side of CAP, and therefore, we know we can guarantee that all our messages are safe and reliable, but we need to make acceptable throughput and latency where acceptable for us is actually the number of messages we get through Kafka as we currently have it configured in prod, which is not its safest mode. So we, we are basically approaching the limits of CAP. So in order to do this, we reviewed the distributed consensus algorithms themselves. We took a look at Paxos, a look at Raft, a look at Zab, see how we could actually tune them, how could we find any enhancements in the algorithms. We've also then taken our preferred one, and we've taken its core reliability features, and we've made them asynchronous in their integration with each other. Um, so we can actually have multiple concurrent reliable streams, and uh, this allows us to effectively replicate the feature of partitions within Kafka. So you can have a topic, you can write different bits of data to different, apparently different streams, and we're doing that with one clever cluster. Uh, in order to do that, the actual implementation uses a lot of promises, a lot of non-blocking I.O., um, but it is still in development. So uh, hopefully we'll get to open source it. Um, keep an eye out on Betfair's blog. Um, we post quite regularly um, updates on various things going on in the company. And so uh, assuming it all works, we will tell you about it on there. So. Back to the title. Yes, our existing tool set, as Dave says, has done remarkably well. It pays for us to be here, but it, it won't scale much further. It really has reached its limit. Um, so the innovation was absolutely necessary. We had to develop advanced tools just due to the nature of what we're doing and the success we've had. We're basically a victim of our own success to some extent, um, trying to stay ahead of our own growth. Um, and apparently we are the world's biggest betting community, and that means our number of requests isn't going to decrease anytime soon. So, to recap, this was the picture we saw earlier. The journal that I'm talking about now will fit between the blue boxes and the matcher. So it will replace everything in the middle, um, and the database will become an eventually consistent store. Um, but the journal will be the source of truth. So, what are these things? Let's, let's go through some things that allow, the innovation allows us to do. So, for example, um, the UI, rather than polling the back end with rather complicated SQL, that takes a lot of processing power mm -hmm. to generate the data in a SQLable way, we can now just subscribe to a stream of data. And the UI 
just finds out what the latest prices are by just subscribing and can update them accordingly. So as and when they change, um, whoever's looking at it gets notified and can act upon it. Now, this is a, a view that you get if you click on any of the selections. So if you click on the little graph button next to any of the selections over there, you get this view. It, it looks a tad old school, doesn't it? Um, it was impressive when we first did it, but these days I think people want to experience a much better interface. And it'd be so easy with the stream of data to have an interactive graph, you could time slice, you could have overlays, um, and you could actually uh, sync messages back in. So you can have an update automatically, and then you can place bets from the graph. You can see the history, and this could be a much better view of what's going on in the market. And of course, our API customers, all those billions of requests a day, well, they could actually decrease because they could just subscribe with the filters, the things they care about, and they would get that same ordered stream, and they could then rely on the data coming into them, and they could then act accordingly from an up-to-date stream of information rather than having to poll very, very frequently. And now, we get to have a play around with stuff every now and again, have a little hack day, and we've come up with a few interesting extensions that we've based upon the stream of data. So you can see this is a typical week on an exchange. The darkest bit there, Saturday afternoon, that's when all the football kicks off in the UK and there's horse racing at the same time. But it means then we can have dashboards and any product person can look at this and go, oh, so that's what your system's doing. And we can drill down into a particular day and we can do some nice visualizations of football in red and horse racing in green, and we can see that um, a particular match there is responsible for a lot, of, a lot of the money that day. And we can drill down further to a particular event and say, ah, so the match odds is the biggest market, um, as one would expect. But previously, a number of these boxes, circles have been a lot smaller. But due to the innovation that Dave talked about earlier with matches across different markets, a lot of these circles start getting to be of equal size as the money gets shared around different markets automatically, which was never feasible before. And whatever else we come up with, like I say, we do hack days, so anyone can come up with any ideas, trial them, and see what happens, really. But it's all much easier now we can just query off a stream of data that's always replayable. So it means then you can recreate the state of the market, find out any errors, find out what was happening at a point in time, and from there, we can run subsequent algorithms, see what's happening. And that's it.